on the next our office is going to be doing the cases. Um, so just kind of an overview of where I'm headed with this presentation. Um, on the second slide, you can kind of see, I feel like a lot of people, when they get a 300-day petition of detention, they're like, oh, I don't want to deal with this case. Um, I think that there's kind of a fear of them. Um, they can seem difficult or scary, and so my goal with this whole presentation is to illuminate what the law is regarding defending 300D petitions, kind of give a walkthrough of how to defend a D case, addressing issues from detention through post disposition, as well as an overview of the big cases as it relates to 300D. Um, and at the very end, hopefully I'll have time to touch on some of the cases and whether or not the appellate court has determined is a certain scenario sexual abuse or not. Um, so in terms of defending a D case, I pretty much operated under the assumption that we are representing the alleged perpetrator. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, and I will be spending a lot of time talking about Lucero L because that is one of the major um, important cases in terms of 300 D petitions. So when you get a D case at the detention hearing, some of the things that you want to be looking out for um, first is, is our client facing any criminal charges as a result of these allegations? Um, if so, you want to keep that in mind as you proceed because as you are aware, anything they say to the social worker, anything they say um, in court here can be used against them in their criminal case. So that's always something you want to check for um, when you have a client who has a deep petition filed against them. Um, at the detention hearing, you also want to start preparing and thinking about your 355 objections and other potential evidentiary objections. Um, make sure that you are looking out for multiple layers of hearsay. Evidence Code 1201 requires that each layer of hearsay in any of the DCFS reports needs to meet an exception. So if you have a detention report, and attached to the police report, and there's police officer statements reporting what grandma said, and grandma said that the child told her, you know, daddy touched her. You need an exception to um, your hearsay objection for each layer of that hearsay, the police report, grandma's statements, and the child's statements. So keep that in mind as you're reading through um, the DCFS reports. Um, a lot of times, county council will just say, oh, well, it's in the police report, so it comes in. Okay, that's fine for that first layer, but what about grandma's statements? That doesn't cover grandma's statements. So make sure you keep that in mind um, as you're reading through the report. Um, we want to be starting immediately from the outset identifying witnesses and evidence so that you can start preparing for the adjudication. Um, and with D cases in particular, we really want to know what is our story. Um, oftentimes, D cases tend to fall into one of two scenarios. You either have what I call the lying stepdaughter cases, which tend to be older um, teenagers making allegations against a stepdad, or you have the family law cases where the parents are separated. It's a very contentious family law battle, and maybe our um, theory of the case is that one parent is making out these sex abuse allegations against the other parent and coaching the child to try and get custody that way. Um, so for D cases in particular, you want to make sure you're identifying your story. Um, in terms of 300 D petitions, what is sex abuse? Um, I just pulled and took it directly from WIC 300 um, from the statute. WIC is not very helpful. It basically just refers to Penal Code Section 11165.1. So it says that anything that's sex abuse, as defined in the Penal Code, that's sex abuse for purposes of WIC 300D. Um, and the, the language in the statute is either that the child has been abused or is at substantial risk of being sexually abused. Um, and that can bring the child in under WIC 300D. So I also pulled the language from the penal code section. 
Um, this is just a summary on the slide. The penal code section is over a page long. It's extremely long. So I did print that out for you on the statutory law handout. You can read it at some point. Um, it basically includes pretty much everything. Um, rape, statutory rape, sodomy, rude and lascivious acts with a child, um, oral copulation, intentional touching, um, and it, it goes into a lot of detail in terms of what specifically is included. Um, but it's very extensive, but anytime you have a D case, you want to pull out that penal code section to see, okay, where are these alleged acts falling under this part of the statute? Is this actually um, a WIC 300D petition or is it something else? Um, so in terms of preparing the trial, um, I'm going to talk about the week, the 355 objections a little later, so I'm going to skip over that. Um, in terms of prepping the trial after detention, when you're coming up on the adjudication, one of the things that you want to be doing is contacting our client's criminal attorney, if they do have one. Um, there was a case that we had in Department 405 where we had the detention. Um, it was... Our client was alleged to have um, raped and sodomized, I think, his six-year-old daughter multiple times. It was horrific allegations. There is an attached police report, and in the police report, our client had confessed to committing all of these acts, and there was also, um, he had taken his daughter into the hospital because she had a stomach ache, and when they got to the hospital, she disclosed oh, sex abuse. So they ended up doing a forensic exam on her, and in the attached forensic exam report, um, included to the detention report, there was, in this actual exam, it said that there was suspected semen basically in multiple areas of this girl's body. So what DCFS is saying is that our client was stupid enough to have sexually abused this child and then immediately took her to the hospital um, where they found this alleged semen on her. So... At first glance, this case obviously looks terrible. It's like, okay, well, this is a loser. Our client confessed. They have this biological evidence. Um, when we spoke with the client at detention, he said, I didn't do it. Um, I confessed, but it, it wasn't me. I didn't abuse her. And so we ended up working very closely with his criminal attorney. Um, it turned out that our client was high on methamphetamine. When he had his interview with the police, he had no idea what he was talking about. Um, when the criminal attorney had further testing done on the biological sample that was taken from the forensic exam, it turned out it wasn't semen, it wasn't biological fluid, it wasn't anything at all. They didn't know what it was, um, but it was not evidence that he had sexually abused this child. Um, so in working with a criminal attorney, we were able to get a lot more information about this case, information that was not presented in the jurisdiction report, um, and information that the court wouldn't have had otherwise, and this actually ended up being a total dis dismissal. Um, so from the day it first came in to the very end of the case, um, things can change. And so it's important to make sure that you're working with our client's criminal attorney. Um, because it can end up really helping them here in their children's court case. And obviously the criminal attorney is going to want to know what's happening in our case. Um, oftentimes you will see copies of the forensic exam that is performed on the child in an alleged sex abuse case. Make sure that we have a copy of that. If you don't have it, we want the court to order the copy of it or subpoena it. Then you want to follow up with the person that performs the forensic exam. Um, I think oftentimes they include, and it's just like a form, and they fill it out and they check the boxes, and the boxes say, um, can either confirm or negate sexual abuse, is consistent with sexual abuse, um, and oftentimes they will check the box that says it's consistent with sexual abuse, so if you follow up with the person that did that exam, um, oftentimes it just means, especially in teenagers who are having sex with people, it means that this exam was consistent with someone who is having sex. It's not consistent necessarily with someone who is being forced to be raped. Um, so you can get a lot more information from following up with the people that perform the forensic exam. Um, also in terms of expert witnesses, Potentially, you may want to consult an OBGYN regarding the results of the forensic exam to see if it is indeed consistent with sexual abuse or not. 
um, you may want to contact an expert, uh, a suggestibility expert. We have a training coming up on 2024 with Dr. Eisen regarding suggestibility um, and memory issues and how children can be influenced. So you may want to talk to someone about that if you have a case where it looks like you suspect coaching. Um, or sometimes, depending on the fact pattern, you may even want to talk to your firm head or supervisor about hiring a psychologist to do an evaluation on our clients to see, um, you know, do they have a sort of propensity to commit sexual abuse on a child. So there are multiple scenarios where you may want to consider hiring expert witnesses on these cases. Those are some of them. Um, in regards to calling witnesses and your questioning, um, there are kind of two different tactics for whether or not you're calling a child who is, for example, 16 or 17 years old versus cross-examining a child who is three or four. Um, you'll want to keep that in mind when you're preparing your trial. You're going to be asking a very different set of questions to a 17-year-old than you would be asking to a four-year-old child. Um, and you want to make sure, especially for the older children who are capable of answering these questions, um, get into a lot of details. Um, really ask them things that are going to elicit, hopefully, um, you know, that, these, that this is not an allegation that is true, that they are making this up. You know, if you're asking them questions and they can't answer the questions or they take very long pauses before answering the questions, then I would argue to the court that that means that they are trying to remember the prior story that they told or that this never happened in the first place and that's why they can't answer these questions. So keep that in mind. Um, also, for D cases, I think it's very important to research case law. There are so many published cases um, regarding 300 D petitions. Um, unfortunately, it's a lot of bad law, just FYI, um, but it's important to know the case law that's out there so you can see if any of it applies to your case. Um, so moving forward, when you're talking about the actual adjudication hearing, some things to be aware of specifically in D cases, um, WIC 355.1D is a um, rebuttable presumption, and it shifts the burden of producing evidence to us in certain cases. So you will always want to check to see if WIC 355.1D applies to your case, if you have a D case. Um, I included the exact language of it in the statutory law handout. Basically, um, anyone, any parent or anyone, an adult living in the home um, with a child, if they have been convicted of sexual abuse here in California, if they have been convicted of sexual abuse in another state that would constitute sexual abuse in California, um, then there is this presumption that that child is a child described by WIC 300, and we have to then, the burden of producing evidence shifts to us, and we have to produce evidence to show that these people are not a risk to their child. Um, the two other scenarios are if someone has been found to have um, committed sexual abuse in a dependency court proceeding, or if they're required to register as a sex offender. The sex offender one is a big one. There are a lot of times where DCFS will file for um, some other issue, and then they find out that one of the parents is a registered sex offender, and they throw that allegation in there. So be aware that under 300D and under this presumption, that then shifts the burden of producing evidence to us to show that our client is not a risk to their child. Um, in Ray Ricky T is a cautionary tale of this example. Um, in Ricky T, there was a legal guardian who was also the maternal grandfather. He appealed a trial court ruling. The trial court said that because he had abused his step granddaughters, that put his grandson at risk of sexual abuse. He had legal guardianship over his grandson. Um, the legal guardian slash grandfather eventually admitted that he perpetrated this sexual abuse on his step-granddaughter. Um, he pled out in criminal court to um, act with a child under 14. And in this case, county council and the court um, both relied on the presumption under WIC 355.1 that 
that because of this, because he was required to register as a sex offender, that meant he posed a risk to this child that he had guardianship over. Um, the guardian did not produce any evidence at all um, at the adjudication hearing to rebut that presumption. And so the appellate court said, sorry, it was your burden at that point to produce the evidence. You didn't do it. So um, this decision stands. So it's a very important presumption to be aware of and just make note if you have one of those cases um, that the burden of producing evidence can shift to us. What would be good evidence? Um, so for example, a lot of the people who are required to register as sex offenders, they're required to do rehabilitative programs, check in with probation officers, comply with any terms of probation or parole. So that would be evidence that we would want to submit to the court to show, look, this person has rehabilitated themselves, they aren't a risk to their child. Um, sometimes also getting the details of what happened in the prior quote unquote sex abuse can also be helpful. Um, because if you're looking at something where maybe it was a statutory rape case and this, our client was 18 and the child was, you know, 16, something like that, and then they have a, I don't know, five-year-old boy. So getting more details about what happened in the prior case to compare to this case to show that it's different. Does it have to be by an expert? The, um the evidence that presents? No, it doesn't have to be by an expert. All it is is that it shifts the burden of producing any evidence to us to show that um, our client is not a risk to this child. Any other questions? Um, well, maybe just one, just to wrap yeah. it up. So it does not shift the burden of proof on the department. Correct. It just shifts the burden of producing the work. Correct. Okay. Exactly. And that's why Ricky T is the cautionary tale, because that that legal guardian didn't do anything. She didn't submit any evidence. And so the court was like, that was on you. You didn't do it. <clears throat> um, so yes, and that's a very good point. It doesn't shift the burden of proof. It shifts the burden of producing evidence. That's an important distinction. But I am, I'm reading 355E. It does say that that finding is prima facie evidence that in any proceeding that, that the minor is described by subdivision A, B, C, or D. So it, it seems like it's prima facie evidence that the child is at risk. Yes, and that's exactly what it is. And then we have to produce the evidence to show that they are not. Okay. Yeah. Can you please repeat the question? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, yes, the question was in WIC 355.1. It says that if our client, you know, is a registered sex offender, or falls under one of those four <laughs> categories, that that automatically constitutes constitutes prima facie evidence that our client's child is at risk of harm and described by Section 300 A, B, or D. And I said, yes, that is what it says. And then that's why the evidence or the burden is then on us to produce evidence that that child is not at risk of harm. Um, so, kind of the most, uh, the biggest part of this training is regarding specifically hearsay in D cases um, and the case law surrounding that. Um, there is a lot of history leading up to the Lucero L case. One of the major cases, um, I gave the citation for it, is in race in the L. This was the first case to create what is known as the child. Um, hearsay exception rule. And in this court case, there was an almost three-year-old child, so a super young child. Um, and this child was observed to be touching herself um, during nap time at daycare. And when the daycare provider walked up to the child and was like, what are you doing? Um, this almost three-year-old stated, daddy always touches me right here, um, and indicating her vaginal area. So mom confronted the child about the abuse. The child denied to the mom that this abuse ever occurred. Then there was a second incident at preschool. The same thing happened. And at that point, the preschool then called DCFS. DCFS got involved. Um, and during that investigation, the child disclosed the abuse both to the social worker <laughs> and to the police. 
Um, there were some pretty significant physical findings um, in the Cindy L case that indicated that sexual abuse may have occurred. And at trial, um, when this child was um, attempting to be cross-examined, um, when she asked if anyone touched her pee, pee her response was the clown. So she's kind of all over the place. She's very young. Um, she's answering questions in ways that don't make sense, but she also um, was able to give some details about what happened depending upon who asked her and when. Um, so based on her testimony at trial, the court ruled her truth incompetent, meaning she doesn't know the difference between the truth and a lie. Um, the court um, let in her statements that were contained in the DCFS report and sustained the petition against the father. Father appealed, um, and the appellate court said, because um, we want to protect children, especially in cases of um, suspected child sex abuse, we are going to carve out this entire hearsay exception for child sex abuse cases. And these statements are allowed to come in even if the child is truth incompetent and doesn't know the difference between a truth and a lie if these three criteria are not and they're listed there. So you need notice that these um, the county is going to be asking these statements to come in. The statements have indicia of reliability, which I will talk about in just a minute. And these statements are corroborated by some other sort of evidence. So in this case, it would have been um, the physical findings that corroborated what the child was saying. So this is known as the child hearsay exception. Case law, this is 1997. Um, so then, after Cindy L came out, WIC 355 was then amended. And WIC 355 now says um, under C1B, that if the hearsay declarant is under the age of 12 and is the subject of the petition, those statements come in unless we establish that they were the product of fraud, deceit, or undue influence. So now we all <laughs> have a conflict here because we have case law that says these statements can't come in unless these requirements are met. And now we have a code section that says, guess what? They're coming in if this child is under the age of 12, no corroboration needed, um, no indicia of reliability needed. So this conflict then leads us to Lucero L, um, which dealt with Cindy L and then the recent addition to WIC 355. So Lucero L is a case from 2000. Um, the facts of Lucero L, this was the second time through the system. Um, in 1994, Lucero was originally detained because her half-sisters were making allegations of sex abuse by the father. That petition was dismissed because those half-sisters recanted their allegations. And then three years later, 1997, we have a new WIC 300 petition filed against the father. A child was detained. And this time, the half-sisters were interviewed, um, and they, were to they told the social worker that they only recanted because they were feeling pressure from the mom and that the sex abuse did occur, and it was continuing to occur. Um, so Lucero was, as part of this whole process, she was interviewed by a social worker, numerous social workers, the police, um, and she made statements to her foster mother regarding the sexual abuse that occurred. Um, at trial, Lucero couldn't qualify to testify. She was truth incompetent, so the parents' attorneys were not able to cross-examine her regarding her statements that were in the social worker's report. And the trial court ruled that Lucero's statements were inadmissible under the Cindy L standard because they weren't corroborated by any physical evidence. But the trial court said, but her statements are coming in under this new WIC 355 um, CB1 exception. So the statements were let in, the allegations of sex abuse were sustained, father appealed. Um, Lucero, by the way, was three years old. And her statements to the social worker and to the police were, in my opinion, um, pretty vague. And there was there she didn't make a lot of statements. Um, she would say things like "Poppy Owie," and the social worker would say "Where Owie," and she'd say "Here" and point to her rectal area, um, or she'd say things like "Here Owie," "Poppy Owie," and you know point to her rectal area. So the statements that she was making are very brief. I mean, she's only three years old. There aren't a lot of details. There aren't any timelines given. 
Um, and in this case, there was no um, physical findings to back up the allegations, but there were the allegations by the half-sisters um, saying that the father had abused them as well. So all her statements came in, even though she couldn't be cross-examined, trial court sustained the D allegations, dad appealed. Um, the court in Lucero L decided that in trying to remedy this conflict between Cindy L and the new WIC 355 statute said that statements that are made by a child who's the subject of a DCFS report are coming in under 355, even if the child is incompetent to testify. So because of this WIC um, 355 section and the age of the child, these statements are coming in. Um, however, the court ruled that they cannot be the sole evidence to support sex abuse allegations unless they have the su um, sufficient indicia of reliability as discussed in Cindy L. Um, I would suggest reading both Cindy L and Lucero L. Um, I think they're very important cases, especially not only dealing with um, WIC 300 uh, D petitions, but child hearsay in general. I think everyone should read these cases. Um, the court in Lucero L said that this indicia of reliability was required by due process. Um, that's why the court said we need these indicia of reliability. Um, interestingly, the uh, court in Lucero L said that the corroboration requirement that was developed by the court in Cindy L um, was a judicial construct. It wasn't required by due process. The indicia of reliability is what due process requires. Um, so when we are talking about indicia of reliability, both in the Cindy L context and in the Lucero L context, you're looking at five factors. Um, in the actual decision, um, both for Cindy L and for Lucero L, it was the first four. I added the fifth one because that one is also addressed in a different section of the Lucero L opinion. So when you were looking at an indicia of reliability and can these statements be the sole basis for sustaining a WIC 300D petition against our client, you're looking at the spontaneity and consistent repetition. Um, what's the context of where these statements are being made or the child making the same statements to multiple people? Um, two is the mental state of the declarant. Does, does spontaneity mean that it's not being said in response to a question? Right, exactly. Um, and the um, second one is the mental state of the declarants. Um, how old is this child? Does this child have any special needs? Do they have any mental health issues that may impact um, the uh, reliability of what they're saying? The third is use of terminology expected or unexpected for a child of similar age. Meaning, are they using statements, are they using words to describe what happened that you would expect a four-year-old to say? Or are they using words that you would not expect a four-year-old to know? Um, the fourth is, is there any sort of motive that this child has to make up these allegations? You know, is there, for example, a contentious family law case going on? Um, has the child been subjected to multiple proceedings or regarding child custody? Um, is the child, you know, upset at one parent or another? So keep that in mind. And then the final factor um, that Lucero Al, the appellate court held, um, truth incompetency is a factor, but it's not dispositive. So you can have a child who the court says you literally don't know the difference between a truth and a lie, um, and their statements can still come in. So it's a factor, but just because they are found to be truth incompetent doesn't mean that their statements are automatically stricken from the record. They can still come in. Um, right? Lucero L is crazy. Um, it, and, and that's why I think that everyone should read it. It's a very important case. It's not what you want to hear as you know, parents and attorneys, and it's frustrating. But I think that it's absolutely a case that everyone needs to know about so they can know um, what to expect and how to defend a D petition. Um, so in terms of the Lucero L case specifically, um, the court went through and kind of analyzed all these factors and said that yes, in terms of Lucero L, there was um, sufficient indicia of reliability. These statements um, 
could not only come in, but they could also be the sole basis upon which the trial court sustained the petition against the father regarding the sex abuse. Um, so you can go ahead and read through those. I'm not going to go through that right now. Um, so kind of putting everything together, um, it's a lot because we have WIC 355, we have Cindy L, we have Lucero L. So where are we after we look at all of these um, different cases and the different sections of the law? And so I kind of laid it out for you here in this slide. Um, hearsay statements of a child under the age of 12. Under the age of 12 is really important um, because WIC 355 differentiates between children under the age of 12 versus over the age of 12. Um, so hearsay statements of children under the age of 12 are coming in. They're coming in <laughs> um, unless we can prove that they are the product of fraud, duress, or undue influence, which is difficult for us to do. So we basically have to prove at that point that someone is coaching this child, otherwise those statements will be coming in. Um, however, because of Lucero L, they can't be the sole basis of jurisdiction unless they have the sufficient indicia of reliability. Um, so it's kind of a multi-layered process and a multiple um, pronged analysis that you have to go through anytime you have hearsay statements with a child under the age of 12 in a D petition. Any questions about that? Um, so in saying that they, the child hearsay exception makes the statements come in in any context, is this, is this regardless of any multiple layers of hearsay? So the foster mom told the social worker that the child said X, Y, Z. Um, is, is, do any other bases under 355 object like the foster mother would be objectionable on her own for statements? Does that have any impact on the Lucero L issue? Um, so for Lancaster, the question was, what about um, situations where you have multiple layers of hearsay? Are those children's statements coming in anyway? Um, and that's why um, I forget what slide it is earlier where I mentioned that for every hearsay statement, for every layer, you have to have an exception. So for Lucero L, the exception is going to apply for the child statements only. In your scenario, if you have foster mom reporting that the child said this, then you're going to need another exception for that second layer where foster mom is saying that. Does that make sense? Um, when you have a child 12 or older, um, it's harder for those statements to come in. Um, you need to meet WIC 355. So either um, there's a hearsay exception applies to those statements, the child is available for cross-examination, um, the um, legislature differentiated between children under the age of 12 and children over the age of 12. Um, so that's why it's important to look and see, okay, how old is this child that I'm dealing with? Um, when I was, just a side note, when I was preparing for this training and researching the child's hearsay exception, I came across something in the dog book. It was actually like a practice tip for minors counsel, but I think you should all be aware of it. Um, in the dog book, it suggested that minors counsel should be arguing in any context the child hearsay exception in order to admit um, statements that are made by a child. So if the Cindy L criteria are met, um, there is an argument to be made that these statements could be coming in in general, not, not specifically about WIC 300D, but about other allegations or at um, um, other types of hearings. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, one other thing I wanted to highlight for the adjudication is WIC 350B regarding in-chambers testimony. I also included that in the statutory law handout. There are very specific um, scenarios where probably minor counsel or maybe the court itself is going to be asking that the testimony take place in chambers rather than in open courts. Um, so that is something to keep in mind as well. Any questions about Lucero, L, Cindy L, 355? Um, so disposition for sex abuse cases, there are three different ways that our clients can be denied family reunification services in a sex abuse case. So anytime you have one, you want to go reference the statute and check it out to see if any of these um, bypass provisions may apply to our clients. 
Um, there are three of them. I, again, listed them all out in the statutory law handout. They're very, very specific. They require specific things. They provide a lot of direction um, and detail in the statute itself. So take a look at that if you do have a scenario um, involving a potential bypass. Um, just very briefly, um, severe sexual abuse of a child by our parent or by somebody else, the court can bypass if the parent has to register as a sex offender that automatically um, could potentially be a bypass provision, or if the parent knowingly participated in or permitted sexual exploitation of the child, um, that also could be a means to bypass. So the court would need clear and convincing evidence that one of these is true, and then if so, the court cannot offer family reunification services unless it finds by clear and convincing evidence that family reunification is in the best interest of the child. Um, so Dennis, that kind of goes back to your question earlier, especially for our clients who have to register as sex offenders. It's really on us to try and get this information before the court that the circumstances were different or that they have rehabilitated or that they've completed some program because there is um, essentially a presumption that Family reunification is not in the best interest, or that um, family reunification um, is going to be bypassed and not, gonna, and not in the best interest of the child, and it switches the burden to us. So for sex abuse cases, you have a hurdle not only with adjudication, but then if you get to disposition and the petition is not dismissed, you could potentially have another um, really big issue regarding family reunification services and disposition. So make sure you're aware of that as well. What's severe sexual abuse? Um, so they are, there's a whole bunch of them listed in the code, and the code specifically says, here's some examples, but it could include more. Um, and it's in with 361.5B6. Um, so for example, they list in here sexual intercourse. That's an example of one. Um, oral sex is an example of one. Um, so they list a whole bunch of them in there, and so that's where you would go to see if your client um, and the allegations that were sustained meet severe sexual abuse. Um, also, um, there are some two cases post-disposition um, that I think are very helpful to know about. The first one is Blanca P. Blanca P is one of my favorite cases. I would suggest that everybody read it. Um, so in this case, there were children that were detained because of physical abuse allegations. There was then a subsequent petition that was filed alleging sex abuse by the father. Um, at the jurisdiction hearing on the subsequent petition, I don't know what was going on with the judge that day, but the judge mistakenly thought that this petition was already sustained um, on a prior occasion. So this judge sustained it again. Um, I say again because he, for whatever reason, thought it was previously sustained, and so he was just going to sustain it again. Um, as part of the new disposition, he ordered a 730 evaluation on the father and the family. Um, we then come back for the 18-month review hearing. The 730 evaluation has been done. The 730 evaluator writes in the um, evaluation. I don't think this sex abuse occurred. Um, I don't find any evidence of it. And so we get to the 18-month um, review hearing. Parents are totally in compliance with the case plan. They've done everything. But they're both still saying, Dad never sexually abused the kids. Probably they were saying that because it didn't happen. Um, but the court um, terminated family reunification services, citing um, the reason being that the parents were continuing to deny the sex abuse allegations. Mom filed a writ, and the court decided that because of this confession <laughs> dilemma, um, where you potentially have a parent who's falsely accused of sex abuse, they have to either confess falsely in order to get their kids back, or if they don't confess, then they risk getting not only TFR, but ultimately um, TPR if the case proceeds in that direction, if they continue to deny the abuse. So the court said that because of this confession dilemma at review hearings, the court has to consider new evidence that cast doubt on the jurisdictional findings. So in this case, the new evidence was a 730 evaluator's report saying, I interviewed the family, this is what I, my investigation, and this is my conclusion, I don't think this happened. Um, 
So the court said that the trial court should have considered this um, and considered this new evidence specifically when the parents continued denial of the allegations is a basis for the um, termination of family reunification services. Like I said, I really like Blanca P. There's a lot of really good dicta in this case regarding parents who continue to deny allegations <laughs> against them, and I think it's a helpful case not only for D cases, but also in any circumstance where you have a review hearing for parents in compliance with the case plan, but they're continuing to deny um, the allegations that were found to be true by the trial court. So I recommend that everybody read that case. Um, the other case that's important for post disposition, specifically in D cases, is in Ray Brandon C. I know that the 388 training touched on this one a little bit, so I'm not going, going to go into a lot of detail. Um, but basically, the court said that post disposition, a 388, is the proper mechanism for resolving issues and potentially relitigating allegations. So when you're talking about Blanca P, you're talking about trying to get the kids returned home. Um, three, you aren't looking at relitigating the allegations. Um, in Brandon C, they're saying that 388 is a proper mechanism where you want to try and totally relitigate this case based on new evidence that has come to light since the original trial. Um, so I think that's a very helpful case as well. One important thing to note is that the appellate court said that this was a case-by-case -case basis. Not every time you have new evidence, not every time you file a 388 um, are you going to get a brand new jurisdiction or dispositional hearing. It needs to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis by the trial court. Uh, but the 388 is the proper mechanism for that. Um, so the last portion of this, I just kind of wanted to highlight some of the bigger sex abuse cases. Um, so what exactly constitutes sex abuse? Um, can siblings come within a J count because their sibling has been found to have been sexually abused? Um, this is the case of NRA IJ. I think a lot of you are probably very familiar with it. It came out of the, um, our Supreme Court. Um, and in this case, the issue was whether the father's sexual abuse of his daughter supported a finding that his sons were at risk of sexual abuse when there was no evidence that dad sexually abused the boys, that he mistreated the boys in any way, and the boys were entirely unaware that the sex abuse was happening um, to their sister. So what do you guys think? What did, what did the, the Supreme Court say? Was this sex abuse? Yes. Yes, it was. Um, and in their um, opinion, the court said that the father's prolonged and egregious sex abuse um, may support a finding that all of his children are dependent. In this case, the father, um, the, the, the abuse was very bad. There was digital penetration, there was fondling, there was forcible rape, there was oral copulation, he was forcing the child to watch, watch porn. The child was... Um, the child was 14 at the time of the petition, and the sex abuse had been occurring for the three years prior. So very bad sex abuse, very long period of time. Yes. No, no, oh, okay. Um, and because it was his biological child, um, and the fact that this abuse was so horrific, the children and the boys could have easily walked in on this abuse happening in the family home, the court said that yes, this can bring the boys within um, the jurisdiction of the juvenile court. One important thing to note was that the court here said that it's kind of a sliding scale analysis. If you have really, really, really bad sex <coughs> abuse, but the likelihood of the kids, the, the, these boy siblings being abused is small, if the sex abuse is really horrible, <coughs> we're going to be able to say that these boys are at risk of harm. Um, whereas on the opposite end, if the, you know, I feel so bad saying that sex abuse isn't as bad, um, but comparatively, if you have a situation where a female child, um, maybe it was just some groping or some touching, um, and you have the male siblings over here, then maybe that's not enough um, to say that the boys would also be at risk of harm. So that is something to be aware of. The court in IJ also said that um, just because one child is sexually abused, that doesn't mean always the siblings come in. It means that they can come in. 
that this is kind of a fact-based analysis and it's a case-by-case -case basis. So make sure that, I mean, I think you can use IJ to our advantage sometimes when you are arguing that siblings are differently situated. Which brings, I mean, it's for the seller. So a lot of times you're in the county councils, especially after this case came out, you're at county council, you know, saying, oh, the cell has been overturned. That's not correct. The cell is alive and healthy and Yes. And there's a sentence in IJ that says we are not overturning right. Right. the cell. Yeah. And IJ is probably one of the best examples of bad facts makes bad law. Um, and so you're, I mean, we the majority of our cases are exactly what you're talking about, the 15-year-old stepdaughter. And mm -hmm. you know, you've got to look at the younger kids. And I think doing a rubicella brief at the beginning of a case not only helps at the defense, because you may have a real defense in striking our client's children, which means our client gets struck from the petition. On the other hand, it also helps if the court, in fact, doesn't go forward with our theory of the defense, because embedding the rubicella brief gives you the um, evidence that you need to convince the court as to reunification and everything else down the line because you're trying to show that sim you know these are not similarly situated children. His children were you know well cared for, no evidence of abuse, wonderful attachment. That that gives you what you need to be able to convince the court that um, there is absolute evidence that this father should maintain reunification and contact with children. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Um, and I think that, like you were saying, after this case first came out, county council just took it and ran with it. And we're like, all right, male siblings are always included um, when a female sibling has been sexually abused. And that's not necessarily the case. And the court um, specifically says that in the opinion of IJ. So that's also a helpful one. And also, IJ was a biological dad, right? Yes. And that was, and it was important, I th I've always thought, that the court stressed that this was a complete abrogation mm -hmm. of the parenting role. Yes. And I've found that I've been able to take that language a lot and convince courts that that distinguishes these other cases with stepfathers and, and or even a bio father whose daughter, whose 17 year old daughter came from Guatemala last year. Yeah. And so that leads us to our next case, which is in Ray DG and the issue of solicitation. This is another stepfather scenario. We have a lot of, like you said, Marlene, a lot of stepfather scenarios. Yeah. All right. Before we move on, I just want to make sure. If the court does find that the siblings do fall within, they can still bypass and bar them. Yeah. Yes. Um, so in, um, in Ray DG, this was a case where there were two um, girls, a 16-year-old stepdaughter and an 11-year-old biological daughter. The family had a history with DCFS, um, including prior sustained depetitions. Um, case JT'd with sole custody to mom, no contact order between the stepdaughter and stepfather. So of course, stepfather moves back into the home. Guess what? Sex abuse allegations come up again. Um, so the case is um, filed again. The allegations are, and, and the facts were not disputed. Stepfather did not dispute the facts. Um, he had offered his stepdaughter money um, in exchange for sex. He um, offered her a car. Stepdaughter said, I rejected him. I wasn't threatened. It wasn't a big deal. Whatever. We moved on. Um, he never touched me. So do you guys think that this is sex abuse within the meaning of 300D? Yes, it is. Um, no, it's not. <laughs> in terms of the policy, it's not. Yes, it is. Um, I'm going to go through these quickly so that I can at least highlight all of them a little bit. Um, the next one is naked pictures of children, Ulysses D. Really weird case, really weird facts. Um, mom and dad were taking <coughs> pictures of the family, of themselves. Um, there was one picture where the dad and the boy were naked next to each other and the dad's legs were spread eagle. Um, there was another picture where the male child was standing naked with one arm reaching up and the appellate court actually said that it was a pose reminiscent of a statue, so like, I don't know, maybe like a Greek statue situation. Um, there is a father 
Picture of the father lying on the bed, semi-erect penis, and then his daughter was in the very foreground looking into the camera. So these are weird pictures, um, <laughs> but they aren't necessarily, you know, what one would normally consider like child pornography. Um, so what do you guys think? Is this sex abuse? Um, yes. The answer is yes. This is it. Um, the appellate court said that pictures don't have to be obscene. Um, they said, nice try, parents. These are pictures. They're typical of a family, like a child taking a bath. Um, these are weird. They're also in the film where mom and dad were taking like super sexy pictures of one another. And so the appellate court said, mom and dad, I think you took these with the intention to arouse yourself. Um, and so that's why the court said that this is sex abuse. Nice. Um, next one is sex abuse by an unknown perpetrator. Um, in this case, yes, no one disputing this child was sexually abused. The issue was, who was it? Was it dad? Was it mom's boyfriend? We don't know. Um, and the court determined that, yes, the sex abuse <coughs> occurred, but because um, we don't know who it was that abused this child, I'm dismissing the, uh, the petition. Um, it was either child's counsel or county counsel that appealed. So what do you think the appellate court said? Sex abuse? Yes. Yeah. Are you sensing a theme? Um, yeah, it was sex abuse. You don't need to know the identity of the perpetrator if the child has been sexually abused out of the Um Fifth one, French kissing. This is in Ray RC. So facts of this case, this is the case from 2011, so a little more recent. Um, there's a 32-year-old man who was having a relationship with his 12-year-old stepdaughter. Again, the facts were totally undisputed. Everyone agreed. He French kissed her on three occasions. Um, on one of those occasions, he reached around her waist and grabbed her, and he told her that he was in love with her and he would wait for her until she was 18. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the petition was filed on behalf of mom's kids. Um, Three kids, two girls including the victim, and then a boy who was the um, father's biological child. So by trial, the child had recanted, um, but dad was still saying, yeah, I did this. Like, it's not a big deal. We're in love. Um, so the court sustained a B, um, dismissed the D, um, and then this was appealed. So what do you guys think? Did the, did the trial court err in dismissing the D? Sex abuse. Um, appellate court said there was sexual intent on the part of the father. They quoted child uh, or human sexuality psychology studies in their opinion, saying French kissing is inherently sexual in nature. And also, by the way, he says that he would wait until she was 18. So yeah, there was some sexual intent there. Um, the last case is in Ray BT. Um, very similar to, to RC. Um, in this case, it was a mom, and the mom was having sex with one of her son's friends slash neighborhood boy. Um, so he was 14 or 15 years old. Um, mom was clearly an adult because she had a 17-year-old child of her own. She then gets pregnant and has a brand new baby. Um, neighbor mom finds out about this new baby, gets really mad, and is like, are you kidding me? My 14-year-old is the parent of this child, goes out and gets a DNA test. Yep, he's the dad. Um, so the details of all of this are a little unclear because both the mom and the 14-year-old dad went back and forth about what happened. Um, the mom said, I was super wasted. I didn't even know I had sex. He took advantage of me. Um, the 14-year-old boy is like, it was always consensual. She never forced me. I never forced her. We had sex multiple times. Um, the mother ended up getting arrested. Um, because the abuse was reported, um, there was a dependency case filed. All of her children were removed. The baby, who she had with a 14-year-old, was about five months old, and then she had the 17-year-old. Um, the only one that was the subject of the appeal was the baby. Um, the trial court sustained the D petition and specifically said that mom demonstrated a lack of judgment and control based on her relationship with the 14-year-old boy. Um, so what do you guys think? Is this sex abuse? Yeah. No. Nope. 
It's not. Um, and so the appellate court said that there was nothing to indicate that the mother was sexually abused her five-month-old daughter. All the other children were well taken care of. There were no instances of mom sexually abusing a child ever. Um, so this is interesting because it's compared to the case prior to RC. I don't know if it's like a male female issue here going on because to me it kind of seems like, you know, um, she was having a relationship with him. And it was obviously sexual because they produced a child together. Um, but the court said no, this is not sex abuse. So this is a good case to be aware of. Um, Can you repeat the case name, please? Yes, case. it's in Ray yeah. BT. It's number six on the list of sex cases. It's a lot. I spoke fast. I apologize. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Sorry. One more question. I guess the question I have about the multiple layers of hearsay, I understand that the statement itself will be a multiple for the other asserted, but Essentially, do I understand Ms. Darrell L to be that, like, if the child makes any statement on their own, then any other statement that, regardless of their admissibility for the truth of the matter asserted, like foster mom saying that the kid said this, uh, some random friend saying that the kid said this, can still be used for the Ms. Darrell L indicia of reliability, just not for yes. admission of the yes. statement that as truth. Absolutely, because it goes to the um, it goes to the component of reputation, okay, um, and which is a factor in the indicia of reliability. Any other questions? <laughs> I will just say, in, my, in, in addition, uh, regarding the confession dilemma, I have had some success in getting dads back in the home where the child is old enough to say, yes, I know my stepsister said he molested her, and um, he's never done that to me, and, but if he did, I have a plan, I would tell my teacher at school, I would tell my mom, and dad gets up on the way to stand and testifies that while he did not molest his stepdaughter, he does understand how bad sexual molestation is, how it steals a child's life, blah, 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 blah. Um, I have, in that case, on two occasions, gotten a dad back in the home. So it can yeah. be done. <laughs> I just want to add one other thing that uh, on the practical side, I haven't seen the department do this recently, and I think it's because we won so many of these cases, but a few years ago they were filing these D cases based on DNA, and we, through discovery and hiring our own experts, were able to show that when the DA was rejecting these because the DNA analysis wasn't correct or there were problems with the DNA, the department was still filing and putting in the complaint that the DNA was part of the finding. We've gotten experts and we've challenged it. I don't know. I haven't seen them recently. But I think it's because we were so successful in exposing that the department really wasn't doing its follow-up on the scientific part. So if you ever get a petition, we do have DNA experts. Dennis did a great DNA trial, and so um, we, we have that information. Thank you, Rachel. And you do have an expert coming later in the month who will be talking about suggestibility, so it kind of piggybacks on today's training. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. 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 Thank you.